So Kimberly gave you a bit of a background, but I've been a mortgage broker since I was 21 years old, and I had an accounting teacher when I was like 16 that taught me a few financial concepts that really helped me get ahead and have a really good life at the young age that I am now. So it's been kind of my thing for the last 16 years to help others, and I just want to congratulate you guys for being here today because learning these few key concepts will really, really help you financially down the road. People sometimes don't learn this stuff into their 50s or 60s, and then their, their time period of building wealth is a lot smaller. So, um, you know, you guys are going to move out. You're going to rent your own places. You're going to need credit cards. You're going to look to buy a home. And so this will kind of set you up on exactly how to do it. As a mortgage professional, what we do is we provide financial wellness by educating, empowering, and elevating people to have a better understanding of how mortgages work to your benefit and how to use the equity, acquire assets, and manage money to best meet your goals at the different stages of your life. So the topics that we're going to cover are the top five myths for millennial home buyers, how to build and protect your credit score, how much you can qualify for in a mortgage, how to shop intelligently for one, the penalties to break one, the terms of a mortgage, getting the best interest rate that works for you, amortization tips, strategies to consolidate debt, four questions to ask when looking for a mortgage broker, and proactive mortgage management, and common mortgage traps to avoid. So millennials, which you guys are <clears throat> on your way to, if not within that generation now, I think you're just the generation after maybe, um, but a lot of people think that they need to save a lot of money to buy a house. They need 20%, which seems a little bit astronomical at this stage in life. Um, some people think that they need to be employed for two years or more, which is not the case. You need three months at a job to be able to qualify for a mortgage, so past your probationary period. And you can get in with as little as a 5% down payment, and there's ways to work with different concepts to come up with only half of that, or get a gift, or borrow it if you need to. But there's ways around that as well. A lot of people think, oh my goodness, well, I'm gonna move. I could live here, I could live in Montreal, I could live in the States, I need to own it for 25 years to make it make sense? Absolutely not. That's not the case. In fact, you're going to spend the money somewhere. You might as well invest it in yourself. Fourth is I have loans that prevent me from qualifying. Some of us have student loans, debt, car loans. Every loan is looked at differently, so don't make an assumption. The first three letters of assume is ASS for a reason, so we like to make sure you know what applies to you. And then, of course, how do you trust that you're getting the right information? And as we continue through this, I'm going to teach you the things to think about because what we're being marketed to and what we're being sold, it's what we're not being told that makes the big difference. So the first thing is, does anyone in this room have a credit card? Yeah, you got a credit card. All right. And is it in your own name? Is it under your parents' name? Okay. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Well, you're going to need, in order for you to rent a place, rent a car, rent a hotel room, all those things, you need your own credit card once your parents say it's, it's up to you now. And the best way to establish credit is to have three credit cards. So I've created the rule 222. Two, two. So you want to have two credit cards at least, with two years of history. So as soon as you're of age to get your own credit card, you want to get it in your own name. And then you want to keep the limits below 20%. So just to keep math super easy, if you have a credit card that has a $1,000 limit, you don't want to spend over 800 of that. And you want to have three of them so that lenders can see that you can responsibly handle credit. And you don't want to go over the... Um, $800 and the $1,000 because that will negatively impact your credit score. Having less than three credit cards will negatively impact your credit score. You never want to go over your limit um, on your credit card. So those three things, just the rule 222. Two, two. Can anyone tell me what 222 two, two is? How many, how many years do you need it for? Two years. Two years. And you want to keep it 20% below the limit. That's right. And you want to have it for two years to get good credit. Things to look out for when you're getting a credit card, a lot of them sell like, oh, no annual fee, annual fee, points. Just keep ahead of that. Some really easy things to do is like, if you guys have Netflix or your phones, you can just have the payment automatically come off that. Like if you have two credit cards, as an example, you can have one having Netflix, one having your Telus bill, and just keep that, keep that rolling so you get a good credit score. And uh, collections are easy to get. So be careful, watch parking tickets if you get parking tickets and don't go over those limits and pay those annual fees if they come along. 
So does anyone here have any idea of what it would be to rent a place? Anyone looking at getting a place to rent or? So let's say if we were gonna rent like a one bedroom out here in Coquitlam, you're probably looking at about $1,700 a month for rent. And just to give you an idea of what that is, you're laughing, is that funny? No. Yeah? Is that low compared to what you're used to or? No, that's high. That's high? Yeah. yeah. So that qualifies you for about a $350,000 mortgage, that same payment is the equivalent, right? So if you look at how you can possibly qualify for that, to qualify for a $350,000 mortgage, you need to be earning about $87,500 a year. So that's $42 an hour in a job when you're out there looking for a job to get that idea. So if you don't have any outside debt, you're looking at $1,700 a month uh, for a mortgage, which is the same as that, what that rent payment would be, and you'd have to save about 5%. Does anybody here have a car? Do you have a car? Do you pay for your car? No. Well, one day, <laughs> when you pay for your car, uh, $480 a month will lower your qualifying for a mortgage by $100,000. So you're better off to save the money, take the bus, get someone to drive you until you can buy your place, and then after that, that'll take it away. Because as you can imagine, $350,000 for a starter place is doable, but you got to certainly be frugal within that. And if you got a car payment for 480 bucks a month, that would take away $100,000 in mortgage qualification. So that's a huge reason why you hear people saying, oh my gosh, it's so hard to move up the property ladder. And sometimes it's just not knowing what to do first or in what sequence is going to actually lead you up for success. But if you think about the seven, if $1,700 a month, you said your sister was paying $2,200 for a place in Vancouver. Right now, if you think about what it would take to save, let's see if the next slide says how much it is to save for a mortgage. It doesn't say that. Okay. I did a spot on Global Morning News um, the other week, and we talked about how you save for a down payment. And if you're 16 right now, and you're living at home, and if you can save about $510 a month, then in four years you have enough for a down payment for between a four and $500,000 place. So if you think about that and you think, oh, there's no way to get in, <clears throat> you can think about if you start when you're 16, by the time you're 20, you have enough for a 5% down payment to buy a higher purchase price than what we even illustrated there. So it is doable, it's just breaking it down to know exactly what it is for you and knowing that if you do that before you buy the car, then you're gonna get yourself ahead financially. And furthermore to that, when you rent your place, that whole payment that we used in that example goes totally to your landlord. If you own that place with interest rates where they're at right now, half of that goes directly to you. And there's no other investment that um, you can invest in yourself like that on a monthly basis and then not pay tax on when you sell it. So <clears throat> when you think of the choices that you can make today to set yourself up for success, knowing this information when you're in your teens, rather than figuring it out later when you're 30 or 40, you can see how that extra decade or two would really benefit you. So when you are considering those things and you think about what that concept is to break down for you and you take it that step further, it's really important to learn how to intelligently shop for a mortgage. I wrote a book called The Mortgage Code and we'll do a draw for one later. Um, but we talk a lot about People think that shopping for mortgages are about interest rates when it's really the other concepts that are more important. Um, lenders know that we have so much going on in life that look at something really easy to market to us to and generally that's the interest rate. But the most important thing is actually the penalty that is applied to your mortgage that they will charge you should you need to make a modification. The second being the terms, the third being the interest rate, and the fourth is actually the, the history of the lender. So penalties for breaking a mortgage, most of us, seven out of 10 of us will break their mortgage before the end of the term because we'll need to move, we'll get transferred somewhere, we'll hate our neighbors, we'll break up with a boyfriend, girlfriend, husband or wife. And so with that in mind, the lenders know that. <clears throat> And when they are marketing to you, they're selling what's so great about them. And they're trying to get you to focus on things like uh, get a mortgage with us and get a free iPad, or get a mortgage with us and get free checking for two years, which sounds really awesome, but what they're not telling you is how they're marketing to you. So if you go there, some of you probably already have a bank account set up. Do you guys have a bank account? Yeah? So one day, 
if you were going to get a mortgage, that bank would come to you and say, oh my goodness, you've had your bank account here since you were six years old. You are an absolute king to us. We're going to give you 2% off the posted rate and a free iPad and free checking. And you're going to think, that's more like it. That's exactly what I thought. Way to go. But what they're not telling you is that they know that seven out of 10 of us are going to break that mortgage before the term because of reasons unforeseen at that time. And they're going to make their money off of you when you go to break it. And they're not going to tell you that they invest in other companies that only give way, way better terms than them because they're competing with themselves. And it's up to us collectively, being you the individual, to understand how the market works for you. And they see it as the borrower's fault for not knowing better. So that's why in our position we get to be unbiased and tell you what the difference is between the two of them. So if you go to a big bank, look, the interest rates look the same, they're so good, oh my goodness, the payment's the same. But if you break that uh, mortgage at 36 months, we've broken down the principal and interest. And if you go to the next slide, we'll just show the difference. So with the big bank, they're using that posted rate that they gave you as a discount from for being so special and having a bank account there for 20 years. Um, but the difference in the remaining balance is $14,000, which is almost half of what you contributed to your principal amount in the last three years. So that penalty would absorb half of that. So you can see the penalty with the big bank is 15000 to get out of compared to 1200 with a lender that you have access to by knowing better to use a mortgage broker for what they're there for. So right away you've left here today knowing how to save $14,000 almost on your first purchase and use that money to move up the property ladder, buy a car, do whatever, anything but pay interest to a bank who's just marketing things to you, right? So then the other things that like aren't as sexy and aren't as impactful, but they're still really important to pay attention to is the terms of the mortgage. A lot of lenders say, oh my God, we have the best mortgage. You can pay 20% at any time. But what they mean by any time is on the anniversary date and the anniversary date is once a year. So it's not likely that we're going to have a calendar reminder to make a <clears throat> mortgage prepayment and just have like an extra twenty, forty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 lying around to make a prepayment. So again, they're banking on what they know you won't do with their own statistics, but they're marketing it to you like it's something really cool. Um, and so the lenders that we have access to, of course, that is the same money as what the banks have to offer, just distributed only through professionals, is the ability to modify those payments. So you can set yourself up for however it is, but if you have something in your life where, um, you know, instead of getting that contract that you thought you were going to get, you get a lower contract or you take a different job for a year or you're going on paternity leave or uh, you have to help a sick parent or something, you can reduce those payments and not impact your actual mortgage and cash flow so you don't go into debt later. Getting the best interest rate that works for you. It's important to know that any lending institution, anytime you go somewhere, they're selling you what they have to offer. They're a business. If you guys know, um, have learned anything about your parents maybe investing in stocks, the best five stable stocks to invest in are always the banks because they totally know how to make money for themselves. And part of it is making money off of us for not knowing any better. So I like to invest in them, not with them. <laughs> um, monoline lenders is money that's provided from the banks, but they offer better rates, better terms, and lower penalties. So having a mortgage broker protects your credit because they shop all the banks, trust companies, and credit unions to get you the best rate. They work through all the marketing data, show you the best options, and you decide which one you want. But at least you don't have somebody that's trying to sell you something that's leaving a big aspect of what the disadvantage is out because they work for that company directly. And also, you know, there's a lot of people who do contract work, self-employed, working on commission, running a business, or you might have several different revenue streams as you continue to grow. And working with a mortgage broker who works alongside your accountant and the other people involved in kind of your money management helps ensure that you protect yourself and get the best options moving forward. He was in his early 20s and he is an incredible um, debate coach and he goes all over the world teaching people and obviously being very young and being very busy and having a super rapidly growing company, he wanted to own a home and he wanted a mortgage for $800,000 and he had a down payment that he already took out of his company. and. His, the lenders that he didn't know, that he just, you know, 
four years old, had a bank account at the same bank, went there. They told him that he'd have to pay himself $200,000 a year for two years in a row. And for him to pay himself that kind of money, he would have had to pay at a minimum half of that in taxes. So it would have made him not be able to continue running his business and pay people and pay a lease and travel across the country to do the coaching that he did. So it would be negative on all aspects. So if he didn't know any better, if his mom hadn't introduced him to us, then he would have continued to rent. But because his mom knew us, his mom made sure that we got in touch and showed him the options that we had. And when we worked out the payment and the options, we found a way that he could get a mortgage. And there's lots of banks out there um, that we have access to that provide different options. So if he went with his bank and he took their word for gospel, he would have had to pay himself $200,000 a year. He might have got a rate of 3.09%. Um, his bank would have charged him a fee of 3.3%, but other banks that look at things differently charge less. He would have had to pay himself $400,000 a year instead of 120, and he would have had to pay 138,284 in taxes, 34%, compared to the taxes that he was paying himself at 120 for 27,000. 184. So his total cost for the two years, even though the interest rate looks low, is $256,000 compared to him getting a higher interest rate and saving all that money in taxes and keeping his business flowing was only $154,000. So it's easy to see when you strip away the marketing and when you learn how to get different access to different things and get people that are working for your corner that incorporate all the tax benefits and everything into it. It's really black and white that there's a lot of options out there and who you know and your knowledge level really makes a difference on how you get ahead. So he saved himself 101, 700 in taxes. He was able to get the home he wanted without compromising his business and he's, he was able to keep the additional $140,000 he would have had to pay himself in his business for reinvestment and for growth. So when you get a mortgage, you'll get an amortization, so the length of time that you're going to pay it off in according to the bank. And generally that's 25 or 30 years, depending on what your down payment is. But when you take a term for the interest rate, it's only for a length of time for that time contract. So it's only for five years on average. 80% of the mortgages that are taken are for five years. And then you continue to renew it until your contract is up. So amortization tips. Um, there's lots of different information that you get out for different times and the mortgage market is changing all the time and one of the biggest things that we find to help people set themselves up for success is taking the longest amortization that's available to you because that gives you flexibility to change your payments with your lifestyle so you don't accumulate outside debt and some people say oh my gosh you should pay it off as soon as possible you should take the shortest amortization possible but you are in control of the amortization even if you take something that says 30 years or 25 years you are the one who makes the payments and decides but it empowers you because doing anything less will only handcuff you and not allow you to qualify for other places some of you might start your career here and, and have a place and if you have the longest amortization uh, longest amortization possible if you get transferred to Toronto, Montreal, and you want to live somewhere else, because you've got that on the longest amortization, you can own somewhere else and qualify easily. So it's about empowering yourself and not handcuffing yourself to one situation because life changes. And mortgages are a one-way street, so you might think, oh, I got a bonus or I got a great contract, I want to put a big lump sum down. But that's a one-way street. You can only get that money out if you break the mortgage or if you sell it. So you really want to be considerate of that. And the banks will say, yeah, put it down on the mortgage because they make more money off of credit cards, lines of credit, because you only make the minimum payments and the rates are higher. Speaking of debt, obviously. Debt is something that you probably hear a lot of people in your family talk about. You hear people stressed out. They have lines of credit, credit cards. Six out of ten Canadians live paycheck to paycheck and debts can accumulate very quickly and the interest rates are very high which makes it impossible for most people to pay off with that statistic. And owning a home gives you options. If you rent a home, your option is bankruptcy or consumer proposal if you don't own a home. If you own a home, you can use that equity to substantially free up your cash flow, allow you to invest and save money while minimizing the interest rate that you pay. Debt consolidation and utilizing the equity in your home will protect you from ever having to go into the 
pr proposal or bankruptcy. And when you're working along someone who's proactive, it really, really makes a difference moving forward. So <clears throat> you might hear it's very common for a lot of people to have a mortgage, a line of credit, car loan, credit cards, store cards, and their total monthly output is about $3,223.29 a month. Uh, if you own a home and you've got equity in your home, you can consolidate that all into one payment. And in this example here, this family is saving $955.92 a month, which if you think about, if you're already working a full-time job, how are you going to make an extra thousand bucks a month? It's next to impossible. And the, using the equity in your home, again, is tax-free. Whereas if you had to go earn a, earn a living and increase your income by $955 a month, you'd actually have to earn $1,500, $1,600 a month and then try to find that time in the day. So you can see that when you know how to utilize your equity properly, it really helps you get ahead. So then questions to look for when you're selecting a mortgage broker. What are interest rates based on and why? There's only two answers for that. And the Bank of Canada is the one who sets the Bank of Canada prime rate, and that's what impacts variable rates. And the bond markets dictate fixed interest rates. So if you hear somebody giving an overcomplicated answer or they kind of give you that blank look, you're not working with the right people there. What strategy are you recommending and why? Uh, getting a mortgage is not just getting a mortgage, shoving it in the shelf. As you can see by some of the examples we gave you, Using them as a tool will really help you build your wealth a lot easier. And will rising interest rates affect me if I'm in a fixed rate mortgage product? Absolutely. Um, the cost of everything is going up and interest rates at one point throughout your career will go up. And so learning how to protect yourself against future payment shock if something happens in the market that nobody can control, again, only empowers you, only puts you ahead of the market and gives you additional opportunities that other people who don't have mortgages that are managed adequately are going to be behind in. And then what commitment are you giving me to personally manage my mortgage over the long term? Again, a mortgage is an investment and it needs to be managed like it. So um, I have expectations of what I expect my advisors around me to handle and that is basically anytime there's a change in the market and, I, and also I want people to be following up with me personally to understand how my lifestyle is going to impact what else is happening in the market because those two things can be very different. So that's what brings us to our proactive mortgage management. So we are continually evaluating um, about every three weeks and then annually on what will impact your mortgage and review opportunities to save money because a lot of people don't even think about it. You just go through life, you're working, you have practice, you have sports, you have activities and you don't think about it. Oh yeah, I guess I could roll my car loan into my house. I guess I could pay off those high interest credit cards and help myself get ahead. And so it's all about planning, optimizing and protecting and looking at ways to save you money. So common mortgage traps to avoid is not understanding the difference between a mortgage broker and a mortgage advisors. Banks are really smart, so they're marketing people saying that they're mortgage, they're calling them all kinds of things, but basically anybody who's not independently licensed by FICOM is working representing only one brand. Um, again, you want to not choose a mortgage based on the interest rate. You could see in the self-employed example, you could see in the example that we started with that you were so quick to pick up on. I didn't get your name. Drew. Drew. You were really quick to pick up on that difference between the 15000 and the 1200 and the penalty. Some people don't learn that until a couple decades later, right? So just knowing that is really, really important. And not understanding the, what that means. If you're shopping on an interest rate, you're not understanding the difference between the interest you pay and the interest rate. And really, it limits your flexibility. And also, choosing a shorter amortization handcuffs you. And not being aware of the marketing traps. Remember, when anyone is marketing to you that works for any one place, it's always what they're not telling you that's the big concern. And when they're marketing something as being really great, like something free or something because you've been a really long client, you just kind of want to take a minute and think about what they're selling you and who they represent and how they get paid. And then not understanding how the lender selected could increase or decrease your options is really a big thing. Lenders don't tell you how they compare or how they make decisions when markets change. So, you know, you guys might notice on a few things. Um, with your bank accounts, you may or may notice, you may or may not notice fees coming in or out. Some banks are really great at offering you something free, but then they jack up the price. 
same thing happens with cell phones and other things, but we know the history, like independent mortgage brokers know the history of what lenders do what in different times. So when we're making an, um, a recommendation to you, we're doing it based on all that encompassed. Obviously, I know you guys find mortgages so exciting. I did write a book on it. Um, and it was a Canadian and US bestseller on Amazon called The Mortgage Code. It's really easy. My 82-year-old grandfather, who hasn't read a book since high school, and English is his second language, found it super easy to read. <laughs> it's um, a little bit of just kind of the stories that I told you today about real life examples, but breaks down a lot more of the detail that I mentioned to you about some of the concepts. And so it helps educate, empower, and elevate you for a better understanding of how to shop intelligently for a mortgage. And all of these things have been done. As you know, I'm going to be singing the anthem at uh, your February 8th fan appreciation game. And every year I've selected a different charity for the proceeds to go to. So last year was Eagle Ridge Hospital Foundation. So we raised $1.4 million for the ER. Hopefully you guys never get injuries, never have to go there. But uh, definitely they needed a new emergency room, so I was happy, happy to be a part of that. And this year is Access Youth, um, so we're going to have a really cool fundraiser for them on the 8th. So looking forward to that. I don't know if you guys listen to the radio, but if you do, 7 o'clock on Saturday nights. I'm on CKNW going into its 11th year on CKNW talking more about mortgages and, and how to help you avoid costly mistakes. I'm regularly on Global and lots of different publications and stuff. So now if you turn on the news and you see me, at least you can say, hey, I met that girl. She taught me a little bit about mortgages. I'm on Facebook and Instagram if you'd like to follow along and learn um, as we go on. And thank you for your time.